Father, tonight we praise you for that amazing truth that you are with us. You're with us in the midst of our celebration. You're the object of our praise. You comfort us when we're broken. You seek us out when we're lost. You've promised that you'll never let go of us. And Father, tonight you're with us here. And I pray that each one of us would sense your presence. We would hear your voice. And we would say yes. We would say yes to Jesus. We would say yes to whatever it is you want to change about our lives so that we can live in your joy, we can live in your presence, and we can see your blessings. Father, we praise you because you never let us go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Uh, if you could have dinner with anyone in the world ever, from history or present, who would you want to share that one meal with? Now, don't, don't answer out loud to me, but I do want you to think about that, and I want you to tell your neighbor who you'd want to have that dinner with, or, and then listen to them as they tell you who they'd want to have that dinner with. You get dinner with one person from history, anyone at all. Ready, set, go. Okay, some of you are like really quick to the answers and others kind of had that blank look on their faces like, I don't know. I mean, there's too many choices to make, right? Do you want to have dinner with Alexander the Great or Plato or Martin Luther or Thomas Jefferson or Abraham Lincoln? You know, who is it from history that, that you would pick? Uh, let me just ask this. How many of you said Jesus? Okay, lots of hands went up. And, that, and you know what? That is, that is understandable. It'd be hard to pass him over, wouldn't it? Especially if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're someone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus as your Savior and Lord, of course you would want to sit down and have dinner with Jesus. Uh, now today we're wrapping up our Taste and See series. We've been looking for the last six weeks or so uh, about how to feed our souls from passages in the Bible that really were dealing with food. There were stories about food. There were teachings about food uh, where that was the object lesson. And so we've been talking about that. And this weekend also concludes our Taste and See Challenge where we've been, uh, you know, encouraging you to read a chapter of the Bible a day, pray with your loved ones every day out loud where they can hear it kind of thing and to serve in a new way or sacrifice something for God. In fact, a lot of people have been apparently looking forward to the end of this 36-day uh, challenge because they keep asking me when it's officially over. <laughs> When's it going to be over so that I can, you fill in the blank, whatever it is you gave up so that you can eat chocolate again or drink Diet Pepsi again or, you know, whatever it is. So, uh, you know, hey, and here's my answer, truthfully. <laughs> it's between you and God. Uh, so, uh, you know... Whenever he tells you you can stop, that's fine. For me, it's when I finish the service tomorrow at noon. So, uh, <laughs> and I already stocked my fridge at home and here. So, uh, for those who are like, oh, are you going to give up Diet Pepsi forever? No. Uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, you know what? If, 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 I hope that it has been a blessing for you doing the Taste and See Challenge, those of you who have taken it up. And, uh, and if it has, if God has really impacted your life, I would love to hear your stories. I'd love for you to email me and just tell me how, because we may want to tell that story to others, because it is about uh, inviting God into your life in a new way. Uh, well, tonight we are wrapping up our series. Uh, the last sermon on the Taste and See series is going to be looking at the Last Supper. So if you've got your Bible or your Bible app open to Matthew 26, we're going to be reading from verses 17 to 29. And, uh, and if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your device, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. And uh, in case you think you can't find it, it's page 1057. So it's really easy to uh, grab and follow along. Uh, picking up in verse 17, Matthew 26, it says, Now on the first day of unleavened bread... 
the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? And Jesus said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? And he answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for, him, for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, is it I, Rabbi? And Jesus said to him, you have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The Last Supper. That meal that is central to all of Christianity. We celebrate it here, whether it's called communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, uh, all different kind of names for this event where we gather around to remember, to celebrate, to honor Christ and his sacrifice for us. His death on the cross, his resurrection, his, his shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, all of that is wrapped up in the symbols that, that we partake of. And by the way, as cross Christianity, uh, from all those different spectrums, we see this differently. It's central to all of us. But what this means is a little bit different to each church that you go to and how they understand it. In fact, uh, in the Reformation, all the Protestant leaders got together and, and said, you know, we're going to make one big giant Protestant church, you know, as opposed to the Catholic church. And, and, you know, the one issue they couldn't agree on was this one, the Lord's Supper, communion. They fought over it and split up and went their own ways. It's one of the reasons you have all these different denominations that are, that are Protestants uh, around here, just because of the Supper. But I want to look at this a little bit differently. Instead of looking at the technical aspect of how we understand the Lord's Supper today and and all of that, I want to look at the Last Supper. And and I want you to see, first of all, that the Last Supper is a meal with friends. The Last Supper is a meal with friends. Uh, You know, we we look at it a lot of times as this big church event. God's doing something so that we can, you know, celebrate it when we get together and we can remember. and, and And it is a teaching thing. But it really just starts off as a a meal with friends. It was Passover. And and Passover to the Jewish nation was like Thanksgiving on steroids. Right? Because we we don't, you know, okay, look, we're Christians. Most of us don't celebrate Passover, right? We're kind of busy with that whole Easter thing. But, you know, if there's one meal a year that uh, almost all Americans celebrate, right, it's Thanksgiving. You know, where we worship gluttony and football all at the same time. And, 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 you know, that's kind of like the universal meal. Well, for the Jews, Passover was even more important than that. It was the whole nation stopped. Everybody was going to celebrate Passover, and Jesus wanted to celebrate it with his friends. Passover was that meal where they were remembering that God had delivered the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt through the, the, the death angel, and he passed over their houses because the blood of the lambs was sprinkled on the doorposts. And, and so God had worked a miracle to set them free from slavery. And Jesus wanted to celebrate with his friends because he knows he's preparing to be that lamb of God whose blood will set us free from the bondage of sin and death and hell for all eternity. And he says, I want to eat it with you, his friends, His closest followers, the chosen 12, the men he has traveled with for three years, who he has taught and poured his life into and performed miracles with. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So he knew what was ahead. He knows what's coming. And he wants to to teach a few more things. He wants to celebrate with those closest to him. And he wants to enjoy the fellowship of good friends and one traitor in the midst. And uh, knowing that, 
I want you to know that Jesus offers to dine with us. The Last Supper is a meal with friends, and Jesus offers to dine with us. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with Revelation 3.20. Uh, you may not be able to quote it, but when you hear it, you'll go, oh yeah, I know that verse. Jesus is talking to the church at Laodicea, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. I will have supper with you. I will have a meal with you. We will sit down and share together. Now, um, I just got to mention this because this verse is um, misused, is the, is the best word I can come up with, uh, for evangelistic purposes. A lot of us have heard, a lot of us have been taught, a lot of us have shared with people, hey, uh, you know, Jesus is standing at the door and knocking, and if you'll you know, open the door and invite him in, he'll, he'll save you. He'll change your life. He'll forgive your sins. And all of that is true, but that's not really the, what this verse is directed at when it's, when it's written in its original context. Because it's Jesus talking to a church at Laodicea. And just as I'm talking to you, understanding that while there are some here who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, the majority of you in this building, and those who are part of Calvary, and we call Calvary your home church, you're followers of Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus is talking to the church, he's not talking to a bunch of lost people that he's trying to get to trust him as Savior and Lord. He's talking to his people who are already his followers, who are identified with him. And he's saying to them, hey, I want to have a deeper relationship with you. Not just the beginning relationship with you. So again, how many of you said you want to have a meal with Jesus? Well, okay, there were more hands a little while ago. Somebody nudge the people next to you, see if they're still awake. You want to have a meal with Jesus? Guess what? Jesus wants to have a meal with you. Isn't that what he said? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. And he with me. And Jesus is initiating. He's at the door. He's the one who's knocking. He's saying, I want to have a meal with you. I don't know about you. That's cool. You want to have a meal with Jesus? Jesus wants to have a meal with you. He wants to hang out with you. He wants to spend time with you. And, and, and just know this. Man, while that's sinking in, that Jesus wants to have a meal with you, if you have a meal with Jesus, uh, he doesn't want to meet at a restaurant where like, you can go after an hour, hour and a half. Hey, i got to leave now. It's great He's hanging with you. See ya. He wants to come to your house. Actually, he doesn't just want to come to your house. He wants to stay with you. Please. Yeah, he wants to stay with you. He wants to move in. He wants to like hang out. He wants to have a long-term, life-altering relationship with you. He wants to take it deeper and deeper all the time. And by the way, it's not going to be your agenda. Because right, we all think, oh, I want to sit down. And I want to have a meal with Jesus. And I want to ask him all those really important questions that are just burning in my mind. Like, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Right? Because we all want to know stupid stuff like that. Because we think that's important, right? And you can tell your neighbor whether you think they did or didn't uh, and why, but you're, never gonna, you're not going to know. And, and I know we've all got these questions that we think we're going to go, I want to sit down with Jesus and I'm going to ask him why this, why that, why that. No, that's not how it works. When you have Jesus for dinner, guess what? He sets the agenda. Because last time I checked, Jesus is Lord. He's the king of kings. So it's his agenda, and his agenda is to transform and bless your life. His agenda is to set you free from your addictions, destroy your destructive habits, and help you feast on his goodness. And you've got this standing invitation that's written in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20, where Jesus is talking to his people, and he's saying, Behold, I stand at your door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him. And he with me. So you have this standing invitation. Jesus is knocking at the door of your life right now. Do you hear his voice? Are you going to open the door? Are you going to invite Jesus in to eat with you? Really what I'm asking, is Jesus welcome in your life? Is Jesus welcome in your life? Now, some of you 
have spent the last 36 days welcoming Jesus into your life. Whether you realize that or not, the Taste and See Challenge was just that. What did we ask you to do? Listen for his voice. Read a, read a chapter of the Bible every day. That's listening for God's voice. What do we ask you to do? Spend time talking with God. Having a conversation with Jesus. Your loved ones are present because you're praying and you're praying for them and you're asking God to bless them, but we ask you to have a deeper conversation. We ask you to serve or sacrifice something in order to honor Jesus with your life. To bless him, to please him, to, to give him that respect. And you probably felt his presence in making those sacrifices or in serving. You see, you've been inviting Jesus into your life. You embrace the challenge and you, you're probably enjoying the deeper relationship with God right now. Thinking, man, what a great few weeks this has been. It doesn't have to stop. You can continue. Now, there's others of you that, honestly, you've heard his voice and you've been wrestling with God and you've been talking and back and forth, but you, you really, you're afraid to open the door. Let's just be honest. You're, you're like, oh, my life is too much of a mess. I can't have Jesus in here right now. Never realizing that he's the one who cleans up our mess. We never can. He's the one who does it. But you're kind of, you're kind of like, I want to open the door, but I'm afraid to open the door because if I really let Jesus in, if I really welcome him into my life, he's going to change stuff, and I'm afraid of what he's going to change. Even though we're hurting, even though we're broken, even though our lives are a mess, we're afraid of what Jesus is going to change. And, and here's the thing. Whatever he changes needs to be changed. But you got a choice to make. You're going to let him in? You're going to welcome him in? And, and let's be honest, there's some of us here who aren't, haven't even been paying attention, right? I mentioned Taste and See Challenge. You go, what? Oh, I remember that. I didn't do it. Okay, well, you didn't. That's the, you know, there's, there's not like we're trying to beat you up or anything like that. You just didn't. You just haven't been paying attention. And you're like, I haven't really heard God's voice. I haven't really heard the knocking. I haven't really been paying attention. But you are now. And reality is right now, Jesus is knocking at your door and you're hearing his voice and he wants to come in. What are you going to do? Is Jesus welcome in your life? You see, wherever you are, whether you've been embracing Jesus, welcoming into your life, whether you're thinking about it, whether you haven't been paying attention, um, I want you to know when we dine with Jesus, it is a relationship of love. It's a relationship of love. Look back at Matthew 26, verse 26. It says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. This is my body. What did Jesus do with his body? He took it to the cross, and he sacrificed his body, his life, for you and for me. Jesus' body was broken for me and for you. He gave his body to save us. The Gospel of John, Jesus spoke these words. He said, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Greater love has no one than this. He laid down his life for his friends. And then Jesus went to the cross and laid down his life for us. When you welcome Jesus into your life, when you fellowship with him, when you eat with him, when you dine with him, it's going to be a relationship of love. Because Jesus loves you. He, he wants to fellowship with you. He wants to eat with you so that you can learn of his love, so you can experience his love close up. You see, if you don't welcome him in in that close, intimate relationship, if you don't throw that door open and say, come on in and hang out, Jesus, with me, then, then all of it is going to be kind of theory. It's going to be kind of that distance where you, you talk about stuff and, and read about stuff and, and think about stuff, but you haven't really experienced it. It's kind of like travel, right? Because you can look at pictures of a place Go, oh, that looks really interesting. You can read about it. Oh, wow, look at that. You learn all this stuff. But until you go there and experience it, it's a little bit different. Actually, it's a lot different. And so Jesus says, hey, look, let me come and hang out with you so you can experience my love. Now, understand this. You can't do a single thing in this world to make God love you anymore. He loves you completely right now. And by the way, there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Even though some of you have done some things and you feel like God couldn't love you, he does. Completely. But here's the thing. 
You can't do anything to make God love you more or less, but you can feed your soul so that you can experience God's love more. That's reality. And, and, and by the way, love is both painful and joyful. So, so if you go, hey, I want to throw that door open. I want to experience that love. There's a little bit of pain because when you sit down with Jesus face to face and you're inviting him over and into your life and, and you're going to have that close, intimate fellowship, at some point you're going to look into his lives and you're going to realize, wow, look at all the things I've done to betray and to deny and to reject my Savior. And guess what? That hurts. It hurts until... You look back into those eyes and you see his love and you see that he embraces you and he wants you and and, and that he's not angry at you. He's not. Because he loves you. But you don't really get to experience that until you throw open that door and you say, Jesus, I want you to come in. And then that love relationship becomes joyful because you experience God's love and you understand that he embraces you and you know how deep his affection is for you. So if you dine with Jesus, it's a relationship of love. It's also a relationship of forgiveness. Forgiveness. Continue on, verse 27. And Jesus took a cup And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. Jesus shed his blood for you so that all your sins could be forgiven. See, Jesus paid for our sins with his blood. And so if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then all your sins are completely and totally washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you may sit there and go, well, does that really work? Yeah, it really does. See, God's grace is amazing. And this means that you are forgiven. Really, truly, actually forgiven of, of everything you've ever done. And really, technically, of everything you're going to do because the blood of Jesus applies to all of history. And if you're a follower, then you're completely and totally forgiven. And that is so amazing. That is so awesome that, that when you experience that, when you understand that, it, it's, it just is wonderful and freeing and you just want to revel in it. Like, oh, man, God is so good. In fact, right now, I want you to experience that. Turn to your neighbor, look at your neighbor, and I want you to say, you are forgiven. All right, see, look, that was so good that that you guys are actually laughing saying that. And and you're like, it makes you feel good. Hey, you're forgiven. Hey, by the way, when you told your neighbor they're forgiven, did you believe it? Okay, some of you are still giggling with your neighbors. When you told them they were forgiven, did you believe they're forgiven? Okay, that is so cool. Now, here's the other thing. Sometimes it's easier to believe that than that we're forgiven. So I dare you right now. To announce another truth, really to yourself, I dare you to say out loud, I am forgiven. forgiven. Do you believe that? Yeah, see, some of you do, and some of you said the words really convincingly. But in your heart of hearts, you're still struggling with that. You see, when we dine with Jesus, he tells us we are forgiven. Over and over and over again. He did it with Peter. Peter, you're forgiven. Feed my sheep. I love you. And he's doing it with you. If you'll listen, if you'll get close to him, if you'll invite him in and, and, and eat with him, he's going to tell you, look, you are forgiven. Because the closer you get to Jesus, the more you realize the beauty and power of his grace. The amazing grace that washes all of our sins away. The powerful grace that changes our lives. And see, that's what we celebrate. That's what we sing. That's why we rejoice, because we are forgiven. And I pray today that you are reveling in in God's forgiveness for you. If not, throw the door open. Invite Jesus to get closer to you than he's ever been. He wants to share his forgiveness with you. And finally, when we dine with Jesus, it's a relationship of serving. Relationship of serving. Uh, I want to jump over. I'm not going to 
ask you to read it, but the Gospel of John, chapter 13, same story, Last Supper, Jesus does something a little bit different, the Gospel of John. He gets down and he washes the feet of his disciples. And you kind of go, that's gross, and it is, and he did it. It was the role of a servant, there was no servant there, they got down and washed their feet. Jesus took on the role of a servant and got down hands and knees and scrubbed the feet of his followers. And at the end of that, he said, I have set an example for you that you also should do just as I have done to you. Jesus is a servant. And when we draw close to Jesus, he talks with us about serving. He he wants us to kind of understand that serving is important. And so when we hang out with Jesus, what happens is we start wanting to serve like he serves. Because he rubs off on us. And, And at some point, we cease being satisfied just receiving from God. And we start wanting to give back. We want to help others. We want to build the kingdom of God. Because at some point, the meal is done, right? And and the meal is over, and Jesus kind of gets up, and and he heads for the door, and he says, hey, why don't you come with me? Because let's change the world together. Why don't you come with me? Because we're going to go take care of some people who are broken. Why don't you come with me, and let's go build my kingdom? You'll find joy when you do that. You'll find purpose when you do that. You'll find meaning when you do that. But he's inviting us. Are we just going to sit there and say, okay, Jesus, hey, go have fun serving. I'll see you later. Or are we going to get up and we're going to follow him out into his activity of changing the world and serve side by side with our Savior? In fact, I dare say that some of you are like, yeah, I really want to get closer to Jesus and I'm doing all the other stuff. This is the thing that's holding you back. Until you put others as more important than yourself and serve them, you're going to miss out on that joy and that intimacy with Jesus. So you're going to follow him? You're going to join him? You're going to serve? You know, we got lots of opportunities around here to serve. we got Servolution Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday where where we're going to bless Thunderbolt Middle School, 7 o'clock in the morning. Stuff's in your bulletin. Check it out. Later this summer, there's a group going to Idaho to to go and do mission work and and bless a community. Maybe you want to go serve that way. Maybe you want to help out with Vacation Bible School that starts like a week from Monday. Or maybe just informally, you want to look around you and see the needs of people and go, I'm going to take care of those needs. I'm going to help them. I'm going to meet those needs. The question is, are you hanging out with Jesus enough to want to serve others? So Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking. Tonight, you're going to invite him in. You're going to share a meal with him. You're going to let him change your life because he's offering if you want him to. Let's pray. Father, tonight we rejoice in how good you are to us. And we thank you for the sacrifice that you have made on our behalf. We thank you that you love us even when we rebel. We thank you that you're a servant who never lets us go. Most of all, we thank you that because of Jesus and his sacrifice, we are forgiven. So tonight, Lord, I pray that all of that would be real in our lives. And I pray that each person in this room would make a choice to open up their lives to you. Deeper, more completely than they ever have. Some maybe even for the first time. So God, let us hear your voice. Give us the courage to throw open the door and let you come in. So that we can experience your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.